Thank you so much for dropping by our channel today. My name is Leah and I'm so glad you're here. You're about to watch the most recent sermon preached and recorded during our weekend services here at Chapel Springs Church. If you're new here, don't hesitate to pop over to our website at chapelsprings.org for more information about our great church. Enjoy the message. distress. I cried out to the Lord and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and deceitful tongues. What shall be done to you? Or what shall be given to you? You false tongue. With sharp arrows of the warrior and with coal of the broom tree you shall be punished. Woe is me that I dwell in Meshach, that I dwell among the tents of Gadar. My soul has dwelt too long with one who hates peace, for I am peace. But when I speak, they are for war. Amen. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you so much. And that was Psalm 120. She's just really glad we skipped 119. <laughs> Longest chapter in the Bible. 176 verses. Go get coffee, come back, she'd still be going. So, <laughs> Amen. This is the summer of Psalms. Are you loving Psalms? I hope you're leaning in with me. And, uh, you know, like all poetry, the Bible's poetry is filled with images to, to ignite our imagination as... God communicates his truth to us. And so this summer image this week, tents, tent camping. Anybody grow up with a family that go camping in the summertime? Anybody? Yeah, we got some hands up. Do we have any ranger people, any ranger commanders? Yes. How about some scouts? Yes. Yes. All right. All right. This is the image. There it is. The lives first and last camping trip was in the Poconos when our kids were little. It ended with two nights in the Holiday Inn in Scranton. Praise God. Our tent image comes from a collection of psalms known as the Songs of Ascents. The Songs of Ascents. These are 15 songs, starting with Psalm 120 all the way through Psalm 134. I hope that you'll read them with me this week because I'm going to preach from another Song of Ascent next week, okay? So we're kind of sandwiched in here on the Songs of Ascent. These are the 15 songs that the children of Israel would sing when they would go on pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times a year. They were commanded by God in the law to gather in Jerusalem to worship three festivals a year where they would leave their homes and they would make the journey, okay? In the spring, it was, uh, in the spring it was Passover. In the summer, it was, what, what was it in the summer? The tabernacles, that was in the fall. The Feast of Weeks, that's the Feast of Tabernacles. Pentecost was in the summer. I had to, see, when I leave my notes, you just never know. Three times a year, Jerusalem was the highest point of the Holy Land. And so three times a year, they would literally go up, not north. When we say up, we think Canada. But they thought up, and they would walk to the festival, so they knew very clearly they were walking up, huffing and puffing, and they would get to Jerusalem, and that's why these are called Songs of Ascent, okay? Songs of Ascent. They were reminders to the people of their historic identity as God's sojourners on the earth, an unsettled people on the move as they followed Yahweh. This whole tent camping thing started with Abraham when God called him out of his homeland to a land he would show him. And it says in Genesis that he literally pitched his tent throughout the land of Canaan 
And so it started there. It continued with Moses. You remember? Moses. God raised up Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt to that land that God had promised to give them through Abraham. And what did they do? They went through the wilderness for 40 years, and they were living in tents. And so there was this Feast of Tabernacles in the fall, and so every year they would literally camp out in huts for a week every year. Some of you are thinking, I can't believe this. It's true. I'm not lying. I don't lie on Sundays on the stage, okay? And so this was embedded in their psyche. This is who they are. They are people on the move. Do you know how many millions of refugees are living in tents right now who've been forced migration, right? This was embedded in their psyche. They were not people that were just get, to get stagnant. They were not people. They were people on the move. They were heading somewhere, and they were reminded regularly that they were pilgrims on a journey with God, to know him, to worship him, to become his unique people, to serve his great plan to rescue the world. This pilgrimage was formational. In Psalm 24, one of their songs, here's what the song says, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who might go up to the holy place, to the mountain, to Jerusalem, to Mount Zion, to the temple. Who might stand in that holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Now, as you know, this pilgrim metaphor continued and carried on into the New Testament. In the Gospel of Luke, when you get to Luke chapter 9, after the Mount of Transfiguration, where they saw Jesus in all of his glory, it says that Jesus then set his face toward Jerusalem. And from Luke chapter 9 all the way through the rest of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is on pilgrimage. Jesus is a ascending up to Jerusalem, and he's taking disciples with him. They're following him. And where, how are they following him? They're following him on a journey upward. Listen, when you follow Jesus, it is always a journey upward. It is a journey upward. They're following Jesus upward. And so when Jesus gets to Jerusalem, what's going to happen? He's going to be arrested, found guilty, right? Uh, trumped up charges, right? So, is that your new little baby? Oh, man. Oh, oh. All right, we're going to cut that out of the tape that goes out. All right. But, um, man, let's pray and dismiss. I just want to see. So they're following Jesus, and what are, he's, lift, he's lifted up to the, to, on the earth at the cross. He dies, he's buried. He raises, and then 40 days later, right, 40 days later, they see him ascend into heaven. Talk about a song of ascent. Come on, amen. Jesus on his way upward. The disciples are following. This continues in Acts. They are called people of the way. They're called people of the road, the path. This is what it looks like when you follow Jesus. He looks at us and doesn't say, stay. He says, follow. It's a movement you're in. Come on, amen. This is a movement. It's a movement. And so we're on the way. We are on the journey, right? Uh, the apostle Paul says it like this in Philippians chapter 1. He says this about himself, this, this concept of being, being heading somewhere and being moving upward with Jesus. He says this, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Look at this, verse 14. Read this one with me. Come on. Read it like you're the preacher today. Read it with me. Come on. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's you. That's me. At Chapel Springs Church, let me wash out my little Listerine thing. 
if you're new, just look to, somebody will explain. Would you explain me to whoever you brought with you? He's inexplicable. At Chapel Springs Church, we talk a lot about the pathway of discipleship. If you're new to the church, we get through the summer, we're going to start Next Steps back up. It's a three-part class, and you will learn that at Chapel Springs, we are a church dedicated to being on the move with Jesus. We are on a pathway here. This isn't just a decision. It is a decision to take a journey together. Amen. And so we talk about the way of abiding, the way of community, and the way of mission. And I want you to know that this pathway at Chapel Springs is an upward journey toward the call of God in Christ Jesus. We are people of the way. I want you to know that it is our heart to not be stagnant, but to be dynamic, to be moving forward. This isn't a journey you take by yourself. It is a communal journey. We are going together. We are pilgrims together on journey. It is a missional journey. We are trying to take as many people upward as we possibly can. Amen. We haven't arrived yet, but we're on the way. It's a distinctive road that we're on. It is against the flow. When you are committed to following Jesus, the culture doesn't push you along and say, oh yeah, go for it. Everything presses against us in the present culture to be on the way with Jesus. It's just true. It's a journey that is worth leaving the old ways behind. I like this idea of Paul saying, I forgot what was behind, I'm pressing on, and it is an upward journey, an upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You're here today, and you're still in the middle of making the decision to follow Jesus. I want you to know right now, listen to me. Listen to me. There's nothing to go back to. Leave it behind. It's not worth it. Leave it behind. This is a great journey you're on. It's not an easy journey. It is not without pain, but it is a joyful journey. It comes with a song list, with a playlist. They went to Jerusalem, and they sang along the way. I hope that Chapel Springs people are some of the happiest, most joyful people in Northern Virginia. I hope you snap your fingers when you walk through the office like I do. We're happy. My life means something. I'm involved in something eternal, and it beats the heck we don't have sound that service anymore, so I clean my language up. <laughs> Out of what I left behind, come on. Amen. So the songs of ascents are songs for the road. We're going to sing this one together. Well, we won't sing it, but we're going to read it. Psalm 120, we've already had it read for us. It is an appropriate song to start the journey. Let's go back. Psalm 120, verse 1. Follow along as I read. Here we go. First song on the playlist, on the journey, the upward call. I call on the Lord in my distress, and he answers me. Save me, Lord, from lying lips and from deceitful tongues. As the psalmist prepares to set out on pilgrimage, he describes his present state and what he's leaving behind. And when he thinks about what he's leaving behind, he's in distress because what he's leaving to go be and abide with the Lord for a few days isn't a good scene. He's distressed. Literally, he's in a tight spot. There is pressure. Notice what's causing it. He's living in a neighborhood. He's living amongst a people of lying lips and deceitful tongues. He's in a culture that doesn't value truth. He's never quite sure whether the banker and butcher are honest or deceiving them. He can never be quite sure if when he orders two pounds of ground beef, whether he's getting 32 ounces or 30 ounces. I did the quick math there 16 times too. He does not know. Imagine a society where truth is totally subjective. Imagine living somewhere 
where up is now down and dark is now light and sweet is now bitter and bitter is sweet. Imagine such a place as John Lennon saying, it's easy if you try. At the end of the psalm, we get more information about his neighborhood. Check out the end of the psalm. Verse 5, check this out. Woe to me that I dwell in Meshach, that I live among the tents of Kedar. Too long have I lived among, among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Now, these are real names of real places, Okay. Kedar was a tribe located southeast of Israel in the Arabian Desert. Meshach was a region in the far north. Now understand that he's not, he's not talking literally here. He's not bragging that he's got two homes, right? Well, you know, uh, I live down, you know, in, in, in Kedar, but when it gets too hot down there, I got, me a, I got me a summer house, right, up in Meshach. No, that's not what he's saying. He's using the places for the reputation of the cultures that are there. The people there are violent. They are warlike. And everything that goes with it, where he's coming from, where he is leaving to go on pilgrimage to abide with Yahweh for, for a few days, where, where the neighborhood he's coming from, these are people that are quick to argue, quick to take offense. They're always drawing lines, taking sides, right? These are the ancient Facebook people. <laughs> Never willing to forgive or to reconcile, and they like it that way. Nothing turns them on like getting out there and dusting things up a little bit and stirring the pot and taking up sides and dividing everybody up. Oh, boy, he's living among the Hatfields and the McCoys. Imagine living someplace like that. It's easy if you try. I am for peace, he says. Now, his word for peace is bigger than ours. Shalom. I am for shalom, right? Wholeness, well-being. I got a definition here from my studies. That wholesomeness of life when living is knit into the fabric of being related to God and to each other. Wow. Wow. Uh, there's another a song on the playlist of the Songs of Ascents. It's Psalm 133. It'll come. It'll get. You read through these and get them on your playlist, right? Oh, how pleasant it is when people dwell together in unity. It's like the anointing oil, right? And God commands his blessing there. Oh, don't you want to live in that kind of a place, in that kind of a community? Oh, man. Yes, Lord. Yes, but I'm for peace, they're for war. I'm swimming upstream here, and I'm getting tired. Notice the lament language again. Last week, we started singing the blues, and it was, it was how long, how long? Remember that? This week, it's too long, Lord, too long. You ever feel that way? You ever feel that way? When you're watching the news and you just you hold your breath because somebody else found out first, did you hear what happened now? Some mass shooting, some crazy walking into a school. When you hear that, when you see that, don't you just break and just want to say, God, how long? How long, Lord? How long? You just want to start singing the blues, right? Woe to me that I live in Meshach, da 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 da. That I live among the tents of Kedar, da 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 da. That's right. I'm for peace, but they speak only of war, da 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 da. It's like we got the choir over here. Come on, let's try it, da 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 da. There you go. All right. I'm going to preach more over here now. I'm going to just take my notes over here. So, so he's like, I can't take it anymore. I can't take it. I'm going to grab my backpack. I'm going to head up to the mountain. I'm going to go to Mount Zion because I must abide with Yahweh. 
Here's the reality. The neighborhood you leave behind needs you to go up that mountain. And you're not going to stay there. See? This is where church is. You've come up the mountain. We'd all walk one Sunday. Maybe not. Okay. Y'all come up the mountain, right? And we're present in the presence of the Lord. We leave the mess out there. We come up the mountain. We worship together. Come on. Amen. We, we are refueled together. Not so we stay on the mountain. But friends, those neighborhoods out there need the church abiding in Jesus. Amen. Eugene Peterson in his, let's have some time for applause. Hallelujah. It, Amen. Yes. Eugene Peterson in his wonderful book entitled A Long Obedience in the Same Direction is reflecting on this very lament that we are reading today when he writes this, a person has to be thoroughly disgusted with the way things are to find the motivation to set out on the Christian way. Not the Christian decision, not to check the box, but the Christian way. As long as we think the next election might eliminate crime or another scientific breakthrough might save the environment or another pay raise might push us over the edge of anxiety into a life of tranquility, we are not likely to risk the life of faith. Now, the dirty little secret that we won't close with today, I'll say it and then we'll move on to greener pastures and happier thoughts, but friends, we tend to look for less painful solutions in life. Do I have to change my lifestyle, start eating healthy and exercising? Isn't there just a pill for this? We're always looking for that easier way rather than that hard work of real change we gotta get down to. Can't we just get out the vote? Get the right people in and we'll eat happily ever after? Do I have to get serious about a prayer life and walking in obedience to Jesus? It seems as though the church in America will try anything as long as it's not the rugged way of discipleship. Amen. There are two great motivators in life. Have you discovered them? Yes. What are they? Someone was in the first service. Don't mess with me. <laughs> the two great motivators in life are love and pain. They are related. Ask my wife. Those are the two great motivators. Both are in play here in the pilgrim way. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Oh, friends, there is love motivating that pilgrim to make that hard journey to be in the courts of the Lord for a day. But there's also pain. There's also pain. When love isn't enough, there's pain. That's what's sandwiched in the middle of this lament in verse 3. Look at what he writes in the middle of it. What will he do to you? And what more besides you, deceitful tongue? He will punish you with a warrior's sharp arrows, with burning coals of the broom bush. If you sit and stew in a place of falsehood and deception and conflict and resentment and bitterness and malice and division and violence over time, there will be consequences. It'll rub off on you. You'll find yourself walking on hot coals pierced with arrows. Have you noticed yet that in the long run, sin comes with its own punishment? I'll say it again and keep saying it till you turn Pentecostal. Have you noticed yet? Have you noticed yet that sin comes with its own punishment? You don't have to wait till the end sometime. It comes with its own punishment. Why? Because as he said a couple of weeks ago, if your center, center is built on lies and idols and the things of this world, the center will not hold. It will collapse. Sin comes with its own punishment. 
We're seeing this play out today gradually in our society. You can't make the choices our culture is making without at some point paying the price. Now, the good news is God is very economical. Aren't you thankful you serve a God who doesn't waste anything? In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Amen. Amen. If you get saved today, tomorrow, tomorrow, you can be sure that there will be an eternal purpose for that flat tire you get on your way to the beltway. Last week, it was only to get you cussing. This week, you see God is training you in patience to become more like Jesus as you're on the beltway. Hallelujah. God doesn't waste anything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He doesn't waste anything. He works in all of it. He doesn't waste the pain. That's just the way it is. Check this out. The Lord allows the result in pain from the way things are to motivate us to take the road less traveled. Pick your pain. One leads to death. Another leads to life. People are making up their own sermons as I speak. I don't know. If I were you, I'd stay sitting there. I'd stay sitting on that side. The Lord allows the resultant pain from the way things are to motivate us to take the road less traveled. By God's grace, following the way of Jesus is hard, but it's good. And in the long run, it's not near as hard as the toll you'll have to pay on sin's highway. Put that to music and let's sing it next week. It sounded like a song. It's the only way out when you live in Meshach and amongst the tents of Kedar. It's the upward path toward the Lord and inward transformation. One of the great Christian classics is John Bunyan's 17th century allegory, Pilgrim's Progress. I have to admit, I am finally getting around to read it. I think my problem was I kept reading the King James Version, and I can never get through it. I'm in the NIV now, hallelujah, and it makes a little more sense. But the protagonist, Pilgrim, keeps my poetry streak alive here because I'm going to read you a, one of his poems right from the book. Check this out. This hill, though high, I covet to ascend. The difficulty will not me offend. For I perceive the way to life lies here. Come, pluck up heart. Let's neither faint nor fear. Better though difficult, the right way to go, than wrong though easy, where the end is woe. Many of you know that the church is allowing me to take a sabbatical this fall, and I leave on September 2nd. I'm going to get to go away for eight weeks, starting on September 2nd. To God be the glory, amen. amen. And it's awesome to go knowing that we've got a, a, a great team of great preachers and great leaders in this church that I get to do this. Thank you so much. About 10 years ago, I took a pilgrimage to Israel and it was life-changing. This time, I'm going to walk the Camino de Santiago. Some of you know what that is. Some of you don't know what that is. In English, it's the way of St. James. I'm going to walk 500 miles across northern Spain. Some of you absolutely can't believe it. You're like, are they, are they going to, are we sending a little Toyota behind you, Pastor? I mean, I... <laughs> it's an ancient way Christians have been walking for over 1,200 years. It will take me six weeks. Lila's going to join me the last week, and she's going to walk the last 70 miles with me. The hotels will be nicer the last week. Okay. <laughs> Why are you doing this, Pastor Scott? Because the exercise is good for me. Can I get an amen for exercise? I need to stay in shape. Because northern Spain is a beautiful place to go for a walk. I'm going to meet a lot of interesting people from around the world hopefully share my faith and my walk with Jesus, and I'm going to meet a lot of other pilgrim Christians that are going to be there. I'm not going to walk alone. Jesus will be with me, and there's a whole bunch of people. Pre-COVID, a half a million people a year were doing this. 
It's a great way to get away and disengage and decompress, and sometimes pastors need it. I mean, look at you. <laughs> but none of those are the reasons. They're not the main reason. I want to slow down and spend time alone with the Lord. I want to be in his presence and hear his voice more clearly. It's how Jesus traveled. When you read the Gospels and you say, well, Jesus went here and Jesus went there, he did it on his feet. Jesus, come walk with me because I want to walk with you. I long for him to do a deeper work within me. Frankly, there are still some things in my life that I'm fed up with, and I want Jesus to do a deeper work. No, you're not going to get a list. There's going to be an awesome altar call. Yes. Amy, let's pray for a good altar call today. I'm going to go on sabbatical right now. I'm <laughs> Friends, the long walk is an outward metaphor for the inward pilgrimage of the heart. We are all on this long journey. I'm going to learn some things as I go. I'm watching a lot of YouTube, reading a lot of books. I know I need to travel light. When Jesus told his disciples, don't take an extra purse. Don't take an extra pair of sandals. I got people telling me, you need to take two pair of shoes. No, Jesus said only one pair of sandals. Because I, I don't want any more than like 12, 13 pounds on my back for 500 miles. I will wash my underwear. It'll dry quick and think it's the kind of... There'll be pain and discomfort along the way. It will be hot. Have you heard about the weather right now in Spain and France? It will rain. The rain in Spain falls mainly on the... That's why I'm walking. I'm told blisters are inevitable. But they say you don't come back the same person. Who knows? Maybe I'll grow an inch. I close, friends, with this thought. If we've chosen to follow Jesus, then we are pilgrims on a journey. Stand up as we finish by reading Psalm 84, just three verses of Psalm 84. I forgive you all in this section over here. I'm thoroughly... I'm thoroughly aware, and you too. I have nobody to blame but myself. Crazy preachers get crazy churches. Let's read this together. Come on. This is a song of pilgrimage. This is you. You're on a long journey. You're going somewhere. Come on, amen. You're being conformed to the image of Jesus. You're part of a great mission to rescue the world. Let's read it together. Come on. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Can you say amen to that? That's you. This is you. Let's, let's bring this forward to New Testament, this side of the cross, this side of the resurrection and Pentecost, and Jesus ascended and the church being filled with the Holy Spirit. How would Jesus interpret this for us? Blessed are those who have chosen to follow me. Because they're not on their own. They are strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit that I have given them. Somebody say amen, hallelujah, amen. Friends, the most blessed thing in your life is you're a follower of Jesus. That is the most blessed thing in your life. Come on, do you agree with me, friend? There's nothing greater than to follow Jesus. Amen. We're blessed.
Amen. Amen. Though the valley of Baca, as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. How would Jesus translate this for us? They don't know where the valley of Baca is, but the word means tears. Some Bible translations actually say, as you walk through the valley of tears. How many of you know that just because you're following Jesus doesn't mean there's not going to be some valleys of tears? It's high time we tell the truth before people sign up. Amen. Not preach some, oh, tiptoe through the tulips, everything's probably going to go ahead. No, sir. No. You might be in a sorrowful place right now. You may have experienced great loss right now. You may be walking through some real deep water, some dark times. But here's how Je what Jesus would say. As you go through those hard times, here's what I promised you. Remember this? Whoever comes to me and drinks out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Of this, he spoke of the Spirit, which he was later going to send after he was glorified. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Friends, there's something deeper in your life than the valley of tears. It is that deep wellspring of the Holy Spirit that lives in the deepest part of you. Come on, amen? That whatever you're going through, you know Jesus is with you. And His Spirit is strengthening you and comforting you and bringing you through that place. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Praise God. And they go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus would probably quote going forward his servant Paul. Because we know this, that he who began the good work in you shall bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I believe in God that all of us are going to make it. Amen. I'm praying for you that you make it. Amen. That we make it, yes, from strength to strength to strength on the journey. To God be the glory. Praise the Lord. So let's come before Jesus right now. Let me just pray this over you. I'd like to ask some people to come down to the front to pray for people that need prayer. If you'd like prayer for healing, if you'd like prayer because you're going through a valley, if you've never made Jesus your Lord and Savior, you've never made a decision to follow him. There are people right down here that want to pray for you. So come on down. Come on down. Can I have a couple people join me closer in the middle here in the front? Just kind of a couple people down. Just kind of make sure we spread out here too. Right here. Yes, thank you. Amen. We got a few people down here. We're going to ask you. I want you to just, listen, don't walk out of here if you're in trouble without getting prayed for by somebody who knows how to pray. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name, put your palms up toward heaven. You are pilgrims on a journey. Yes. I'm speaking over you right now. You are a child of God with an eternal destiny. Hallelujah. You are not alone. You have a community of brothers and sisters with you. We're going to do a cookout August 14th. All over Northern Virginia, there's going to be cookouts. We want somebody to go to some, one of them in their neighborhood. Why? Because we want to get people connected and ultimately get in life groups. So we stop trying to walk alone. Amen. We're together on this great journey and it's hard but it sure is a whole lot better than following the ways of this world to god be the glory so let's be joyful today come on amen let god put a song in your heart you are a follower of jesus and you are blessed to god be the glory now jesus i pray as we dismiss today i pray that you will just bring father pull people up here to the front for us to pray for them Whatever you're going through today, friend, believe God with us. We want to trust Jesus for you. Whatever your need might be, we would love to pray for you. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Now go live for Jesus, okay? And if you'd like prayer, you come. Let's hang out right here. You come. We'll pray for you. Amen.
Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and make sure you turn your bell notifications on so you know each and every time we push out another video. Until next time, let's go live for Jesus.